Um, could I ask Professor Gil Klein to take the stand? Uh, well, I am a complete outsider, as you will realize, in this, <laughs> in this context. <clears throat> and I am still not quite sure I at what level I should speak to you. On the one hand, I feel like a duck introduced to face a distinguished collection of ornithologists <laughs> and tell them the duck's tale. And I will do that. On the other hand, I'm a biologist. And since sociology stands on the shoulders of psychology, and since psychology stands on the shoulders of biology, I feel I should also speak to you at that level. But I will probably jump back and forth between these two different levels. I grew up in Hungary, uh, left for Sweden at the age of 22. But when I started school at the age of six in Budapest and started reading tales, these tales could be about a Slovak who could not be trusted. You should not let him into your house because you get, then lost the house or about a Romanian who was dirty and had lice and was spreading diseases, or a Serb who had a knife and could kill you easily, or an Austrian who was a coward. And of course, the Hungarian was the clean and the valiant and the heroic. And uh, when I came to Sweden, I looked for similar stories about the other Scandinavians. <laughs> and I couldn't find any. Actually, what I found was a sort of nice, relaxed joking like I experienced um, uh, last evening between our chairman and a Norwegian colleague. Something totally different. And yet, Scandinavia used to be one of the most violent corners of the world, not so long time ago. Uh, what are the reasons? Where is the difference? Can you tell us? Uh, when the Holocaust came, and I'm Jewish, I suddenly experienced this incredible surprise. The surprise was not the Nazis, we knew about that. And not the Hungarian Nazis who wanted to kill us, we knew about that. And perhaps not even the people who helped us and who were some of them just wonderful. The great surprise was that the vast majority of the people, our schoolmates, our fellow enjoyers of Hungarian literature and Hungarian culture, a culture to which we definitely thought we did belong and to some extent made it, looked the other way. And it's interesting to say, to um, state that the first Hungarian politician ever to acknowledge this fact is the present prime minister, who, as you may know from the recent scandals, is a person who speaks what he thinks is the truth without any manuscript. He went to Auschwitz and um, walked the March of the Living from Auschwitz to Birkenau and then gave a really historical speech, the first sentence of which was, we let their hand go. Like uh, you are going with a child and holding his hand and suddenly you let the hand go. And then he went on to state the totally absurd in the fact that a presumably sovereign nation turns over 10% of its citizens to a foreign power for this sole purpose of being murdered. What was the difference? What was the difference between Budapest and Copenhagen, for instance? Why were the Danish Jews Danes? Why were the Hungarian Jews Jews? What were the causes of the late and deep resentments in Hungary, which we did not understand, did, did not realize, that accepted, if not welcomed, the Holocaust? I'll come back to this in a moment, but first I want to go to Schmuel Eisenstadt, who says that genocide constitutes a very widespread, potentially universal aspect of human society and history, a basic manifestation of the destructive potential of the human behavior. Well, of course, indeed. Uh, why are we alone in the homo species? Why are there not other subspecies as there are among so many primates? Well, we have killed them off, of course. Uh, there is excellent evidence of cannibalism, not very much liked by socially correct scientists of various kinds for a long time, but the evidence is there. Actually, now that the uh, Neanderthal man and the cro man is being sequenced from bones remaining at museums, uh, the 
the molecular biologists are delighted to have the bones after a cannibal feast because they have been so well cleared of every trace of meat that they were not attacked by bacteria and you can find the DNA much more intact. Uh, well, uh, Shmuel Asinsha speaks of the breakdown of the major codes. And the major codes are, as he calls them, primordiality, civility, and sacredness. Uh, primordiality, gender, kinship, territory, language, constructing and reinforcing the boundary between inside and outside. This boundary is usually perceived as naturally given. Civility or civic consciousness, the civic code, is constructed on the basis of familiarity with implicit and explicit rules of conduct, traditions, and social routines. And then there is the sacred or transcendence that brings the boundary between us and them, not to natural conditions, but to the realm of the sacred and the sublime, defined as God, reason, progress, or rationality. Now, let me jump back to Hungary of my childhood. What was the reason that they looked the other way? Well, recently, by pure chance, <clears throat> I got a book that was published in Hungary in the 1960s. <clears throat> Sorry. It contains the conversations of a journalist, Senes, father of Hannah Senes, by the way, <clears throat> with the secretary, a high priest, of the Cardinal of Hungary, Sharedi who was the cardinal during the Holocaust. And here for the first time do I read in an articulate, intelligent way the deep resentment that was felt by Hungarian largely Catholic society against the Jews. This was concerned with the concepts of the primordial social order. And also with sacred, sacredness, not with civility. With civility there was no problem. We were part of the civil society. But it is clear that the traditional Catholic view has seen modernity, the liberal cosmopolitanism of Jews, as an undermining force, as a force breaking down family, breaking down everything that was considered sacred. It was not sad because there was politeness, but it was felt. Now, it has to do, of course, with the we and them barrier. It is one of the most strongest biological forces, as we know actually from many sociological studies, uh, that if you take people and, or, or t teenagers, assign them numbers randomly, put them into uh, a summer camp, and uh, then make two groups, one group the even, the other the odd numbers, how quickly is the we, them uh, distinction developing? And how quickly th does the notion come that we are okay and they are not? Within a few days, if not hours. Clearly, this sociology must have had an enormous survival value during our revolution. And it is again what I would like to stress, that behind everything is our evolution. And if we have learned one thing of modern molecular biology, from the sequencing of the genes of humans and other species, or rather the enormous surprise we got was, first of all, the small number of genes we have, and uh, the other is the way you, we use them. Uh, when the Salk Institute was built in the 1960s, Jonas Salk asked, asked Leo Szilard, who was a nuclear physicist but advisor to Jonas, whether they needed a mouse house. And Jonas said, yes, in spite of the fact that it is expensive because a coli bacterium in the intestine is not a man, and Drosophila is not a man, but a mouse is a man. That was then, in the 60s. Today, or yesterday, <clears throat> Craig Venter, the sequencer, or one of the sequencers of the human genome, said that only now do we realize that Drosophila are small humans with wings. Absolutely true. Uh, the conservation is enormous. And I then venture the statement, uh, which usually shocks non-biologists, that civilization is a thin varnish above our limbic system. 
that takes over at times of stress. And where, of course, we come to genocide as a widespread, potentially universal aspect of human history and behavior. Now, I'll soon finish. I just want to go back again to this distinction between different societies in relation to the Holocaust. Uh, what is the key word? Is the key word interwaving, a word which is often used by Schwarz Eisenstadt? Is that what then dissolves the we them barrier? Uh, is intermarriage the key word? And we heard the example of Brazil and other countries in Latin America. And it's a great contrast to former British colonies in Africa, but not to French colonies in Africa, because in French colonies in Africa did uh, such an intermingling occur. Uh, I would like just to raise the question, <clears throat> how much and to what extent are sociologists prepared to allow in psychology? And a word that was anathema for a long time, to let in biology. And finally, ending again with psychology, the one dimension I lack <clears throat> from the cultural discussion of genocide and the Holocaust, interesting as it is, and it's extremely interesting to a non-sociologist like myself, I don't see any discussion of individual differences. What, at the basic level, made the difference between conformism versus individuality, opportunism versus adherence to moral principles, and neurotic versus stable personalities. That, of course, as we know, made the difference in the most striking way between the murderer and the resistance man. Thank you.